Everybody's been pruned. It's okay. There's no shame in it. I've been pruned a lot. So don't feel like there's shame in pruning. Anybody? I mean, I, I can't attest to you what the fruit is because I'm going through this right now. Uh, it's really funny to me, actually, all the sermons I've been hearing and how they pertain pretty much exactly to the circumstance I'm at right now. Um, uh, over the past week, I've really been struggling a lot with just faith in general um, in a lot of the circumstances I've gone through. Um, I, and it's really interesting to me, like, getting this article talks about, like, he sees this professional gardener as being, like, just a terrible, terrible thing. And, like, I've been looking at my situation as something that's been caused by Satan and by evil. I, I never once thought to think, you know, maybe this is what God's trying to do in my life, right? That just makes sense. The fact that I'm here today and I'm mean, reading this really speaks to me. Um, I'm going through a lot of emotional things right now, a lot of uh, just like life questions in general. Um, I don't really know what the fruit is that's going to come out of this, but I mean, that's really just where I'm at right now. Yeah, definitely. I mean, a lot of times we go through things in our life and during the storm, during the pruning, we feel like it's an attack. We feel like we're suffering evil. We feel like the devil is at work. But then at some point we look backwards and we realize that it was the hand of the Lord and we're just grateful. You know, in Hebrews it says that all discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful but sorrowful. Yet those who have been trained by it afterwards, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. And so the Lord is always correcting us. He's always working on us. You know, I I remember reading in a history book that Michelangelo, when he was carving, he could look at a piece of rock and he saw what it was that it was going to become. And so there's this really famous one of Mary holding Jesus right after coming off the crucifix and it's in Rome and it's considered one of his greatest carvings and it was a piece of rock that had been passed over by other people it was not considered to be like a prime piece of marble but yet when Michelangelo laid eyes on it he saw in it that which is commonly regarded as maybe one of the greatest if not the greatest sculpture ever made and that's the way the Lord is he sees us as a finished product. He sees how you will be in heaven one day. But while we're here, we're getting the chisel, constantly being adjusted, and it's not always pleasant. In fact, a lot of times it can feel awful. So how can situations in life reveal the condition of our heart? Definitely. And, you know, situations, you know, they can reveal our heart good or bad. You know, it's interesting that, you know, you might have a job loss at some point, And instead of seeing it as a gift or seeing it as an opportunity for the Lord to readjust you, maybe you're just thinking about, well, what am I going to do for money? And so maybe... You know, your heart was really fixated on money as a first priority, and it had become an idol. And so hardships in our heart can reveal that either there's idols there or that our heart really is fixated on the Lord. You know, it makes me think of in Genesis, 
the Lord tells Abraham to offer up Isaac as a sacrifice. And the very next phrase in Scripture is, So Abraham rose early in the morning. He didn't ponder it. He didn't think about it. He didn't kick the can down the road. He didn't go, well, is that really what the Lord said? No, he got up early to make it happen. His heart was in a perfect state of obedience in total faith. And that circumstance revealed that about him. It's a test that revealed his total willingness to submit to God beyond even what we could imagine. Number three, have you made comfort an idol like Dave Furman did? If so, how? This is a total America question. Right? I mean, don't we all love comfort? I mean, how many of you have driven past a fast food restaurant, you were thinking about getting dinner there, but you saw too many cars and you said, no, no, I won't, I won't be inconvenienced by that. Or what do you mean you want me to go inside? What? You want me to walk in the building? How dare you? you know, we, we love comfort. And it's, I'll admit, it's a weakness of mine. And I've worked on it over the years. And when I first started coming here and I joined, and this was a, this was a while ago, and Donnie Mayo was over singles at the time. And I remember him taking me to lunch and trying to pitch me or convince me to go to Honduras on a mission trip. And he looked at me and he goes, now, you're going to have to rough it a little bit. And I said, well, let me stop you there. <laughs> he says, my idea of roughing it's a hotel that doesn't have room service. What's yours? <laughs> and then he proceeded to tell me about buses over dirt roads and no running water. And I said, you know, I just, I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet. And shame on me for thinking that, but I was young in my faith, and that's where I was. I was not prepared to sacrifice comfort for the Lord, and I still struggle with it. I'm grateful that the Lord, what a gift to be born today. <laughs> I mean, you go back a thousand years, and a, and a king couldn't eat like we do. I mean, out of season, no problem. We'll bring it in by plane. What a novel idea. I can have tuna flown in from Japan if I want to. It's unbelievable. You live like a king and you don't even yet we don't even appreciate it. We're so blessed. And if we're not careful, that can become our first priority. You know, and it can really deactivate us. You know, comfort is one of the one of the greatest impediments in the American church towards being successful because Jesus calls us out of our comfort zone. And that's hard when, you know, you take climate control and delivery of food for granted. It's just a, it can be a tough thing. So let's get into the reading and get going here. Um, right before we start, just as an intro, this is the night before Jesus was crucified. This is his last sermon to his disciples before going to the cross in the morning. And he is explaining to them what existence outside of his physical presence is going to look like. They don't comprehend it yet, but he's about to be gone. But yet his spirit, the Holy Spirit, is going to come, and he is explaining to them what a victorious life, what it means. You know, and there's different levels to kind of understanding Jesus. You know, and as we've gone through these I am statements, you know, yeah, I have the I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is salvation by no other name but Jesus. It's a very simple concept to grasp. And then you have the I am the bread of life. It's another layer down where we start looking at the fact that when we feast on Jesus, not only is he our salvation, but he is the source of what sustains us. But now we get into this section. And in this section, there's going to be this word abide that's going to come over and over and over again. 
And this is maybe the deepest of all of the lessons that Jesus has. Because it really gets to the heart of why we exist. Why did God make us? What's our purpose here? What, what is it all about? It's this. This is really, when you boil it down, this is, he's talking about the essence of our existence and what it means. And so if you were, to me, if I was to dwell on anything in Scripture from now until I die, I think I could dwell on this and never really reach the bottom of what it offers. It's really a huge, huge pinnacle moment for Christ. Hunter, would you open us up? I am the true vine, and my father is a husband. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in Okay, so what does, what's Jesus getting at here when he says that he is the true vine and my father is the vine dresser, is the husband? He uses this word true vine. What, what, what do you think he's getting at when he says true vine? Source. Okay. Anybody else? Kind of like the core. Core. Definitely. Yeah. True vine. It's also a warning in it that there are false vines. That there are false teachers. That there are deceptions out there. And he is not just saying that I am the vine or I am a vine. It's that I am the true vine, the only vine. Beware the false prophet. You know, and and then he goes on in verse 2. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it. So what's Jesus kind of starting to hint at here? Does anybody kind of see where he's starting right away as he opens it up? Kind of just cutting away this idea of trial. Yeah. So it's either you're going to be uprooted if you're not doing anything, or else, yeah, even though you're going to bear fruit, you got to be cut back to bear more fruit. Exactly. There, there's no neutral yeah. in Christianity. Mm-hmm. You know, if, if, if you think, well, I'm going to get saved and I'm just going to go about my way, you're going to get pruned every day mm-hmm. for the rest of your life until you die. Mm-hmm. And you're going to be miserable the whole time. Jesus is calling us to action. Christianity is not just a noun. It's an action verb. It's a way of being, a state of existence. And he's declaring it right away. And then he gives us the assurance that we're clean. And that we cannot bear fruit unless we abide in him. Zach, you want to give us uh, verses 5 through 6? I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, Okay. So, right away, we've got it broken out. What is Jesus, why does Jesus call himself 
the vine and us the branches. Why do you think he's using that that analogy? We what? grow out of him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We grow out of him exactly. Anybody else? Well, you wouldn't have the branches without the vine. Yeah. That's exactly right. You know, it's interesting when you get... You know, I'm not much of a gardener. I don't have really a great green thumb. It's just not my thing. I've never really put effort into it. I grew up, you know, originally downtown Chicago. Trees were planned things in the city. You know, you really didn't. I remember the first time as a child, my mom taking me to the park, and I remember being afraid of the grass (laughs) and her actually touching it and telling me that it was okay. I'd never seen it before. I was like five years old and I'd never seen, you know, grass before. I knew how to hail a cab, but, you know, I didn't know what to do do with grass. It's a different existence. But Jesus here is saying that he is the vine, we're the branches. You know, most of the flowers I've ever bought are cut. And when you go and you buy cut flowers, you go get some roses, they look real pretty for a couple of days. And then what happens to them? They're dead, right? They wither and they die. And if you ever if you ever prune like a little shrub or a bush or even, even a flower thing, and you break it, if you notice there's this sticky residue that kind of hits your hands, this sap. And that is the life circulating through the plant. And everything that that branch does, everything that comes out of that branch is from that sap that comes from the core. And interestingly enough, you look at these flower plants, and the flower isn't struggling to be a flower. You know, when you, when you look at a fruit tree, the, the fruit isn't struggling to become fruit. It just is. It's its nature. It receives that life force. It doesn't worry about anything. It's not afraid of anything. It's just attached to the tree. It's receiving it, and it's just doing exactly what it was created to do. There's no thought. There's no effort. It just is. That is the picture of a relationship for us when we abide in Christ. Christianity is not supposed... You shouldn't be so worried all the time about what am I supposed to do or what am I here. You're abiding. And when you draw close to him, all of a sudden, you just start to feel it flowing through you. And it just becomes part of who you are. And then he talks about those that do not abide in him. I don't even want to touch into that, but... He's talking about hell. Those that don't know Jesus, again, by there's no other name. It was scary. I was reading some survey thing, and I forget the exact number, but it was something like 60% of American Christians in a poll do not believe that Jesus is the only way to salvation. Because so little of the word of the Lord is being preached in the church that we've drifted to that point. All right, verse 7 through 11, Naomi. But if you remain in me and my word rem- words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. I have loved you even as the Father has when you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. Okay, so here he is transitioning to a discovery of what fruit looks like. When we abide, we produce fruit. Now he's talking about what does this fruit look like. So what does spiritual fruit look like? 
Love. Yes. Exactly, the fruit of the Spirit. You know, Jesus says it's by this that they will know that you are my disciples, by your love from one another. You know, and in Galatians it says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there are no laws. You know, when you love someone that's different than you, when you're kind to people that are being cruel to you, when you forgive somebody that's done you wrong, that's what the fruit of the Spirit looks like. People are going to do you wrong. It's sin. But when you hate that person for what they do wrong, you're giving in to what the devil wants. What you should instead see or feel is this incredible sadness that they're lost. That they wouldn't be doing that to you if they knew Jesus. You know, if somebody steals from me, the, the first thing you think is, oh, I want to get them. They did me wrong. But isn't it all the much more sad that the reason that they're doing that is because they don't know Christ? It should be heartbreaking. It should be an opportunity to want to minister. You know, Paul wrote in Romans that if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not over, be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That verse really... Yeah. This has nothing to do with um, the topic, but it's related. Um, it's just that it's We in prayer. And, you know, it's interesting. This verse reminds me a lot. How many of you, a lot of you are younger than me. How many of you remember the planes hitting the towers? You remember it? I still remember it. I remember that moment when I had, I was dry. I was in my, it was a sophomore in college. I remember I was driving into school when that first plane hit, and I thought, what a terrible accident. Then the second one hit, and I remember the fear and the panic. But it's interesting, as we look back 20 years later, what a squandered opportunity for us in so many ways. You know, we were, 20 years ago, we were the preeminent power in the world, and there was nothing but open arms of sorrow. And in a lot of ways, we responded to this very evil thing with a lot of evil of our own. And we embraced torture as an interrogation technique. And, you know, these horrible pictures of Cuba came out and what we were doing. And our ideals have always been what drives us. And, you know, the legacy of 9-11 for us is mixed. You know, of course we have to defend ourselves. But, you know, I remember growing up in America before 9-11, and we were a lot less afraid. Mm -hmm. We were a lot less fearful. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I miss that America. And it was a crossroads. You know, it was probably, from a historical standpoint, our country probably changed more on 9-11 than at any point in history, maybe to the Civil War. 
It was probably more of a crossroads than even World War II. And it's worth thinking about what the legacy of that is because we want to do good as Christians. And we want our country to do good. And, you know, people are going to come at us and attack us as Christians. And it's important that we don't repay evil for evil. That our values always come forward, that who we are. We don't want to send mixed messages. It's always about love. Alex? 12 through 14. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You all my friends, if you do whatever I can. Amen. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. And so many of those names that got read this morning were firemen that ran up into those towers. As people were running down those stairs, they were going up, looking. And there were a lot of them that died. Greater love has no one than this, that he would lay down his life for another. It's the ultimate sacrifice. It's what Jesus did. And Jesus laid down his life for us while we were yet enemies to him. While they were cursing him on that cross, he said, forgive them. They don't know what they do. That's the ultimate act of love. And when we abide in Jesus, that's what we should be reflecting. Fifteen through seventeen. Jay? I do not call you servants any longer, because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I've called you friends, because I've made known to you everything that I've heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask in, in my name. I'm giving you these commands so that you may love one another. So what is he what's he getting at here as he closes? What's Jesus really hammering towards us? What's he trying to convey? Anyone else? Well, just to me, he's specifically like in verse 15 when he's talking about um, slave and master and being friends. Like I look at that as like a master is only going to tell like the slave so much and they're not going to know any other information. Whereas friends, we're doing life together. We're sharing everything that's going on. And so to me, that's like Jesus made himself available to us and wanted to get to know us and meet us exactly where we were at. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. You know, this is exactly what Paul is talking about in Galatians when he says that we have not received a spirit of slavery, but a spirit of adoption, that we can cry out, Abba, Father. In this closing statement, Jesus is literally conveying to us that We are no longer in the bondage of sin. That we are slaves to sins. But that in him, it is no longer us that live, but Christ that lives within us. And since it is Christ living in us, we have the right to be called children, sons, and daughters of God. The intimacy of the relationship can't go any further. You know, in verse 8, he says, By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. 
that right there is the essence of why we exist. You know, we were created to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. That's our purpose. That's why we're here. We are here to glorify God and to enjoy Him. And the only way that we can do that, which is the Westminster Catechism, by the way, that's not a special insight of mine, that is... But that is the opening statement in what's been the statement of faith for so long in the Christian faith, is here we are to glorify God and to enjoy intimacy with him by abiding in him. And when we abide in the Lord, that is when we can have victory. Because apart from that, once we're separated, we're like that cut flower. And we wither and we die. And you might not notice it right away. You know, if you miss a day of reading the Bible, you might not really feel the disconnect. Man, by day three or four, all of a sudden the glory starts to fade. And you're only as much like Jesus as the time that you've spent with him that day. Really, it's a wake up and do it over. Every day we have to continually draw near to him. To seek to abide in him. You know, in Psalm 128, it says, How blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. When you shall eat of the fruit of your hands, you will be happy, and it will be well with you. Your wife shall be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children like olive plants around your table. And he's using that illustration to describe what a godly family looks like. But that same illustration is carried forward here where Jesus is illustrating that when we abide in him, we are like a fruitful vine. Bearing much good fruit. And that fruit is kindness and love and patience and joy. And in that fruit, that intimacy, we can be the difference maker that the Lord calls us to be. All right, action points. If you would...